Great, thanks, Tom. Um, welcome back, everyone. Uh, so yes, yesterday we uh, spoke about tensor networks in general. I guess we introduced those graphical calculus, drawing pictures, and uh, we had this general motivation, right, of, of parameterizing quantum states in some uh, kind of intuitive, uh, hopefully conceptual, meaningful way. And at the very end, we we uh, discussed a particular structure, a particular ansatz of tensor network ansatz of family uh, called matrix product states. Right, and, the, and this was, was this very regular one-dimensional structure, and we discussed uh, what features it had. Um, well, we, we didn't discuss a lot about it, but but we discussed this this entropy property, right? That basically these states by construction satisfy an area law. Uh, so today, I want to discuss these matrix product states in more detail. That's the first uh, item on the agenda, and then, uh, well, that's probably uh, take us already uh, a little while. Then I want to briefly discuss uh, about the higher dimensional situation, and then. Um, um, well, talk about what 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 we are, what we are going to do if an area law is not going to be uh, uh, satisfied. So, for example, what about critical systems? Uh, does MPS still apply, or do we want to go somewhere else? And the somewhere else will be uh, what is known as MERA. So, all these acronyms will make sense later. Um, so, that's going to be the plan uh, for today. Hopefully, we are going to uh, we'll be able to wrap up sort of this uh, tensor network generalities part, then move on towards uh, holography. Uh, inspired constructions, uh, but maybe it will also take us maybe 20 more minutes tomorrow, so we have to see how it goes. So this is, I think, uh, roughly speaking, the picture we uh, ended on yesterday with a bit more detail added. So matrix product state was defined, so so, so, so that's an ansatz for quantum states, many body quantum states on a line, right? So the, as yesterday, these dangling legs, they correspond to the, to the physical subsystems. So if there's n of those, this thing would define a quantum state of n spins or D-level systems corresponding to this blue bond dimension here. And then we also have this choice of uh, a virtual bond dimension, capital D, uh, which as we discussed uh, briefly controls the entanglement um, in those states, okay? And then here I gave these tensors names, so this is T1, T2, T3, and so on up to Tn, okay? So this picture, so a choice of, uh, well, choice of this particular graph structure, choice of these little d, capital Ds, and choice of tensors determines a state. Uh, I guess I call it cat MPS here uh, in that Hilbert space, that many body Hilbert space. Okay. So uh, maybe the first, uh, yeah. So we already discussed some properties of that state. Well, we discussed this entropy scaling, uh, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But maybe before that, um, one question to ask is where, well, you know, where does this name come from? Matrix product state. Um, where are the matrices that we are producting, that we're multiplying? Uh, maybe if someone has an idea or already knows. Uh, well, I'm. Um, Writing. So what could be the matrices? So maybe as a hint, um, you could ask, you know, how actually, how, how do you actually compute the, the, the coefficients of the wave function that's defined by this picture, right? So how would you actually compute, um, say if you have a bunch of, uh, right, you take a basis state, I1 up to IN, so, each of these i's right there range from one to d, and you're interested in say this coefficient of the quantum state. So how would you actually compute this? Okay, so there's sort of a graphical answer and a symbolic answer. The graphical answer, maybe I'll give you while you, th while you think about the symbolic one. So for this, I would basically just copy uh, my state, right? So that's the cat. Now I have to multiply it with a bra, and the bra is just a tensor product of bra i1, tensor bra i2, and so on, right? And so maybe graphically, I could denote this as follows, right? We have these little Oops, with these little triangles, which yesterday I took to, well, yesterday I defined um, to mean uh, basis states, I2, I3, and so on. Oops, sorry, it's uh, somehow not very pretty, IN. Right, so these little um, triangles, um, well, they have a single leg, right? So they correspond to vectors, and I, I take them to mean basis vectors in CD. So I, I is the i's basis vector. Right, so now this thing is a number, there's no dangling legs anymore. Um, and uh, maybe uh, now people start seeing matrices, or maybe not. So maybe I continue drawing. Well, uh, you feel very free to interrupt me. This is sort of the odd, those two are sort of the odd ones out. Okay, I hear some noise. I think someone wants to say something. So with, with the lower legs fixed, all of the tensors become D by D matrices. I guess the ones on the end are vectors. That's exactly right, thanks. Yeah, perfect. So all of these green uh, blobs, right, they're all D by D matrices because we only have two dangling legs. And then on the left, we have a vector or 
co-vector depending on your taste. And here we also have a vector, right? So we could give these uh, uh, matrices respect, no, right? And so what we're doing really, right? We're taking this matrix, multiplying it with that matrix, multiplying the next matrix and so on. And then on the very left, right? We're adding a, we're taking row vector on the very right, we're taking column vector. Um, so that's that's exactly the point. So maybe writing this as an equation, we could say, well, we take the first uh, tensor, which is really a matrix, but we fix one of the indices. So by maybe, maybe I denote it as follows. Then we take the second tensor, that's a three tensor, but we fix this bottom, this blue index to be I2 and so on up to Tn minus one, In minus one, Tn, In. Um, and maybe I'll just draw this here uh, uh, in blue to denote that the index that we're fixing is the one uh, corresponding to those legs. Okay, so that's a bit of a horrible notation, but, but hopefully together with my story, it makes sense. Right, so this is a, a, I guess a row vector, matrices, matrices, column vector. So that's right. So we're just doing matrix multiplication. So the, the coefficients of the wave function are very structured. They're given just by matrix products. So matrix vector multiplication at the end. Those guys are matrix multiplication. Okay, so maybe that's very concrete. <clears throat> How many parameters do we have uh, in this ansatz, right? I mean, the whole point was to uh, determine, well, to to, uh, to find an ansatz for many, but a state that's more economic than just writing it on the wave function. So, well, how many parameters do we have? Well, we just discussed, these are all three tensors in the middle, and then we have the, well, the two, two guys on the side that are even lower dimensional. Well, each three tensor, right, the dimensionality is capital D times capital D times little d, and we have capital N of those, so like N minus two plus the, the boundary ones. So we have, um, Right. Uh, at most, um, n times capital D squared times little d, uh, many parameters, right, in this ansatz. And that's to be compared with uh, little d to the n, right, which is the Hilbert space dimension of the state uh, that we are defining by this picture. So the dimension of that space over here. Okay. So we see that that's a very economic ansatz unless uh, this virtual bond dimension, capital D, uh, becomes exponential in the system size, where right? then we are not saving anymore. But say if uh, capital D were constant or maybe polynomial uh, would grow as a polynomial in the system size in capital N, and that would uh, that would be a big win, big save. Okay. And that's uh, hopefully, right, so, so to justify this ansatz, hopefully that's going to be true uh, for states of interest. Good in the sense that we save. Or maybe we're just, you know, it could also be that we're just interested in building fu uh, you know, funky states, then we wouldn't care about this if we do pen and paper. Uh, calculations, but say for numerics, that would be important. Um, this scale would be important. Um, okay, um, maybe uh, another thing that we could discuss is the interpretation of those states. Um, I guess we discussed one yesterday. Um, so by virtue of this entropic, entropy scaling, right, so it's like states that come with an area law, um, but we could also ask, you know, how can we actually, well, actually, I think we discussed actually two, uh, two interpretations. We, well, we two prop two interesting about well, the, the entropy property, but we also had this. I, I mean, I think someone of um, actually mentioned, or I think two of you maybe even mentioned that this is kind of like a Markov process or kind of like some cellular, some automaton or something, right? So we can sort of sweep from the left to the right and prepare the state step by step. And um, that's true, right? That's 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 a completely legitimate interpretation. One can make it even more physical under an assumption, namely if we assume that these tensors they are not, not just arbitrary tensors. But suppose they suppose um, uh, maybe well actually that's going to be maybe my second interpretation but I'll, I'll write it first. So assume uh, these three tensors are not uh, you know completely arbitrary, but they have the property that if I think of um, say one of these virtual bonds as an input of a linear map, and the other two as outputs of a of a linear map. So I think of the three tensors defining a linear map from the left leg to the right as together with the bottom leg. Suppose this linear map is isometry. Okay. So isometry, right? It's like unitary, like it means that it has one, but it has a one-sided inverse in this case. So this on map, the dagger of this map times this map uh, is the identity. It preserves angles, preserves inner products. Isometry is exactly the things that you can implement by you know unitary time evolution by say a quantum circuit if you also have some ancillary quantum systems floating around. But no, no measurement, no post selection required. So suppose, um, suppose all of these uh, blobs here are isometries, right? Well, the last one should just be unitary because uh, in this case, well, I, can, I guess that could still be an isometry. Um, 
And uh, uh, well, the first one kind of only has output. So that's kind of like preparing a state. So then you, we could interpret actually this picture as a process where we start preparing the state. It has one physical in, you know, subsystem, one memory subsystem. And then we're applying this isometry to the memory. We update the memory and we spit out you know, one more acutid. And we just proceed with a step by step by step. And so in capital N many steps, we could build a quantum state. So maybe we don't have to be super precise about this, but in, in a sense, you can think of these states as being created by a sequential uh, quantum process. Now, I did assume that, uh, well, I made this assumption now that these tensors were isometries. Uh, it turns out that's without loss of generality. So any MPS, any matrix product state can be written in such a form. There's some kind of gauge freedom in the tensor network and we'll hopefully see this in a moment. So for now it's an assumption, but it, not really. There's another interpretation for um, that's again sort of maybe vague, uh, but but useful. Um, another way of thinking about these states is in the following way. So, if, um, so we have all these tensors floating around, right? And then we contract them uh, together. We can also think about this in a different way. We can also imagine uh, we start with lots of maximally entangled states, but they're sort of ultra local. They're just maximally entangled states between adjacent sites. Okay. And well, maximally entangled states, right? They are sum over uh, a cat a tensor cat a. It's just lines for us in this tensor network language, right? So a maximum entangled state is just a line. Here's another maximum entangled state. Here's another one. So just a bunch of lines, right? And now suppose, uh, you know, this is the, uh, I don't know, say the second side. I guess that's the first side, the second side, the third side, fourth side, fifth side, and so on. I guess I shouldn't draw these bubbles because now I, I take them to mean sites and not tensors at this point. <laughs> so so imagine, right, sort of each site um, of the system, so each uh, yeah, site has sort of is maximum entangled locally with the left and with the right. So we could start with, you know, this sort of very strong but very local entanglement, and we could sort of try to glue it together, right, because and we could sort of project down these virtual entangled bonds uh, to create the physical state, okay. So as we can again think of this as some kind of process, but now it doesn't have to be unitary or something, which is, uh, well, let, sorry, let me just write this slightly differently. So let me maybe draw, maybe give them a little spin, a little bump sort of to, so I don't know, so that, so I'm, so I'm thinking of time now going this way in some sense. So I'm starting with this entanglement, local, 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 and now I'm going to apply linear maps. And they're linear maps from the two virtual bonds, right, which are the ones that are now being entangled with the left and on the right. And I'm going to create the, the physical uh, system in this way. So now I'm going to apply this linear map, right? Down here, down here, down here, and so on and so forth, right? And well, here there's just one index and here's the other one. So it's of course, I'm drawing the same picture, but I, I told you a slightly different story now, right? So before the story in interpretation one was left to right, and now it's sort of top to bottom, it's starting from the entanglement and it's sort of projecting it out not projection in the mathematical sense, but just the sense of like mashing things together and you know maybe possibly arriving at a lower dimension system. Um, so this, this interpretation, um, uh, I guess, uh, gives rise to the name uh, PEPS, PEPS, which is short for projected entangled pair state. Let me take, start with entangled pairs and then we're sort of projecting them down. Um, so that's, uh, I'll write this here. So, the, uh, so what we're doing in this process, we start with entangled pairs and we, project them down. And that's, of course, makes sense uh, in much more general generality. We can take some arbitrary interaction graph. For each edge of the interaction graph, we can take maximum entangled states along the edges. And at the vertices, you can apply such a projection. And in this way, we can define in some local way a quantum state on a graph. As some of the graph structure gives us you know, the entanglement we start from. Uh, and that's what is called PEPs. And we'll talk about it more later. But the, sort of, we can already see this uh, this idea appearing in this uh, in this one dimension set. Okay, so these are two uh, interpretations. That's sort of more storytelling, right? So, how do we actually compute with these beasts? Uh, so, the most basic question you could ask a, a a vector or tensor is, I guess, as we discussed the norm, and we already discussed how to compute normative tensors, right? We just take the tensor twice. Well, once the tensor, once it's complex conjugate, and we contract all the legs together, all the pairs of legs together. I'll still write this down, but in some sense, it's a special case of what we already discussed, but it's gonna be interesting to write it down. So how do we compute um, these matrix product states? So the norm, right, so this vector, so norm, we'll say, let's say norm squared. As we discussed earlier, we are just going to take um, our state. 
Um, now we're going to complex conjugate it. And from now on, whenever I draw things, you know, whenever I put a, a tensor on its head, then I'm, I'm going to complex conjugate in my head as well. So, when, so I'm going to draw, so this is the cat, then the bra, I'm just going to draw the same, but upside down. And implicitly I'm thinking of the tensors being complex conjugated. So now I have a, a, the bra and the cat, and I'm just going to connect them up, right? Like so. It's very sad. I guess uh, this will also not help. Oh, okay, almost. Right, so that's how we compute the norm in general. But now there's something interesting happening, right? So there's now, again, several ways of actually computing this in practice. One way of computing is from top to bottom. So if I did it from top to bottom, what I would do is, well, I would actually create this quantum state, say, on my computer. And then I would also create the bra, right? And then, uh, well, I would get a number. But here is a much smarter way. I can just do it sideways, right? So I can actually start. So what I can do is I can um, say, uh, start with this object, which is a, a, a two tensor, right? It's very small, d squared amount of space. And then I can apply this object, which I can now think of as a matrix from the two left indices to the two right indices. It's kind of like a trans operator, right? Sort of a trans operator from the left to the right. So I'll, uh, maybe I'll draw this slightly nicer. Um, so let's focus in on one of these uh, blobs here, right? I can think of this thing as a map from here to here. On the left, there's d squared many degrees of freedom. On the right, there's d squared many degrees of freedom. So I can think of this as a d squared by d squared matrix. Right. And so I can just multiply this matrix from the left to the right. Um, and the mem memory doesn't grow with the system size, right? So it's very easy to do this for really large systems. Um, and I, uh, and in contrast, right, if I actually prepared the quantum state, all this exponential saving that I was hoping for, of course, would get lost. So somehow it's a, a bad idea to do with this, a bad idea to do it this way, a very smart idea to do it from left to right or right to left. Um, are there any questions about this? So somehow, right, the, the general point is, of course, if you have a tensor network, the order of contra contraction matters, order in which you contract the bonds, if you wish. If we do it in this way, then we can just do iterated matrix multiplication. So that's like, uh, I don't know, n times d to the six uh, operations or something uh, to compute this norm. Um, very good. Maybe it's a fun exercise to write down actually an expression for this matrix uh, in terms of uh, say the, the tensor here. So right before we discussed that every tensor gives rise to many matrices, right? Whenever I fix an index here, I get a matrix. So each, for each tensor, I have a tuple of matrices. And the question is, how do we actually write this d squared by d squared matrix in terms of those matrices, right? So there's a matrix sitting here that completely determines this transfer operator. And I would like to write, well, you could, if you like, you can think about uh, computing an explicit expression. Using some Kronecker products and whatnot. Great. Um, okay. Uh, we can, well, we can compute more interesting things. Uh, for example, expectation values of local operators. Does anyone have an idea how to do so? Well, expectation values, sorry. Oop. Yeah, suppose I have some local operator sitting here. Maybe it's some, um, maybe subsystem A has two, two indices. So it's like two adjacent spins, some operator OA. I want to compute this expectation value. So expectation value of OA in this matrix product state. Do you make a, a sandwich with the top and bottom? Exactly, exactly right, yes. So maybe let's see if I have uh, something here. Oop, fantastic. So right, so that's the same thing we had before, except these, these uh, I have to stick this operator in here, right? That's basically the picture I, I, I want to do that. That matches probably what you had in mind. Right? And so why do those lines go through? Well, because we don't put an operator there, just identity there, right? Because it's a local operator. And so now, of course, we can compute this in exactly the same way, right? From the left to the, from up to here, right? We can compute basically, well, this whole thing, which is in the end going to be a, a, a vector with two indices or a matrix, if you want. Um, we can compute just as before on the same, in the same way we compute, we can compute this right environment, right, as a two tensor. And then the thing in the middle, it's complexity will of course depend on, on, on this operator OA, but if this operator OA is you know, supported on a fixed number of sites, then whatever that, that number of sites is that will determine the complexity of the resulting object. So we can kind of do it in three bits, left bit, the middle bit, right bit. Okay, and it's clear, right, we can insert more than one operator. We can compute, uh, you know, 
other correlation functions, um, the thing that determines the complexity in the end is, of course, how many we have and how how large well how large is the product of these operators. But again, by uh, doing the contraction in, a, in the right way, so this uh, horizontal way, uh, things are easy. Okay. Now, um, how about the reduced density matrix, the reduced state of, say, subsystem A? Well, row A is, of course, just a thing I get when I, well, when I compute expectation values without fixing the operator, right? So I'm basically just cutting a hole into the picture we drew beforehand. So if I want a tensor network representation of the reduced density matrix, I would literally take this thing and then remove the operator again, right? So now that's an object. So when, of course, I'm assuming here that, that, that this corresponds to subsystem A here. So the A, this is the A subsystem. Right now I have an object that has, you know, uh, well, twice as many indices as A, and that's because the density operator is browsing cats. And so, so the, uh, I guess, bra of the density operator sits here, the cat sits here, or the other way. I think I said it the wrong way around. The cat sits here, brass sits there. Right. So I, I guess that looks maybe very similar to kind of some pathological reasoning uh, you all are super familiar with. But here we can also do it with tensors and finite dimensions, and it works great. Okay. Um, now, uh, this trans operator picture also um, uh, tells us uh, something about uh, uh, correlations. Uh, maybe I'll leave this as an exercise uh, to think about this. So, um, I get, well, so what is the yeah? What is the question that I want to ask there? So I guess we motivated. Um, well, one of the motivations I gave uh, when I had two motivations. One was entropy is not as large as it could be, and correlations decay. So maybe a question could be, um, you know, maybe you can identify fairly general conditions on a matrix product state so that it is again true that correlations decay. So I guess for that, we should first uh, draw the picture corresponding to a correlation function, which is a uh, more well, precise thing. I guess I wanted to sweep under the rug, but, but let's maybe do it anyways. So, well, it's going to look the same as here, right? And then maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe on sub somewhere else, there's subsystem uh, B and right, we put in another operator there. Oop, thanks, what's going on? So maybe that's that would be the picture for say um, this correlation function here, right? And then maybe you would like to subtract the disconnected parts, the product of the corresponding pictures at the top. Okay, so this is some operator OA. Oop, there's another operator OB on the right, and hopefully I did connect it all the right way. Okay. So somehow, if you think about uh, what is the thing that mediates correlations between uh, the left and the right, right? Well, it's exactly this tra these transfer operators sitting in the middle, right? That's kind of the thing that communicates between, you know, the part where this operator OA lives and the part where this operator OB lives. So imagine, you know, you are in some like, you know, regular situation. So for example, imagine you, you're defining a translation variant state and all the tensors you pick are the same, right? So the system continues infinitely say, to the left or you know, a lot to the left, a lot to the right. And then in the middle, you well, you have some well. There's some separation here, right? There's some separation between the, the, the two sides, with so some distance between A and B. And this distance, of course, well, it's just the number of sides in the middle. Okay. And now somehow the the, uh, the I, I guess the the question is so maybe another exercise. So assume uh, that we are in a translation variant situation, meaning that again all the tensors are the same, right at the top. Um, then you know maybe find an sort of a, a, a sort of a, a reasonable argument, not a mathematical proof, or maybe find a condition, a, a reasonable condition, on this transfer operator, which is now the same for every side because of translation variance, such that correlation functions decay exponentially. So exercise is find condition on this transfer operator, and again the transfer operator is the thing we highlighted in orange above. And in the general case, it's site dependent, but here it's not because of translation variance. Um, so find conditions on this guy. Well, I guess if I oriented that the other way around, it doesn't matter, such that correlations decay exponentially. Correlation functions, two-point functions decay exponentially. In, this, in the, exactly the same sense that we discussed, uh, that we discussed yesterday. 
right? So it's, you know, you have a matrix, you take it for large power because there's lots of sites in the middle. Um, yeah, maybe that's all I want to say here. I mean, maybe we can talk about it tomorrow or if you have an idea, you, you, can, you, can, you can write on Slack. Great. Um, so so that's, uh, that's sort of, I guess, how to compute with these objects. Um, now, we already discussed yesterday um, the role of, uh, well, the relation between this ansatz and entanglement, all right? So I'll just give a little recap of this now. So how about entanglement and matrix product states? Well, it's, go it's going to be, as we discussed, uh, uh, controlled by this bond dimension, capital D, by bond dimension, capital D. And what we found is we found an area law and that held just by virtue of the state having this particular form. And the, what it looked like as well, um, any Rennie entropy is of course upper bounded by this max entropy, which was the zero Rennie entropy. And the max entropy, which is the same as the logarithm of the rank of the reduced state or the logarithm of the, rhythm of the rank of the quantum state, if you think of it as a matrix between A and A complement, uh, uh, we, we discussed can always be upper bounded by the size of the boundary of A on this, you know, if you think of A as a subsystem of, of this one dimensional line times logarithm of this virtual bond dimension. So the bond dimension enters in this way. And here we have this nice area law. Okay. Actually, let me make this up. Right. <clears throat> and, um, well, we could maybe briefly uh, discuss again why that was so, maybe just by giving a proof by pictures. Um, right, so the idea was proof if you want. So our state looks like that. Um, with lots of those. Okay, so suppose we're interested in this subsystem, well, this subsystem over here. Um, then, right, the rest is going to be the complement of A. So test this part and that part. Um, so what I can think is I can coarse grain this picture um, and I can basically think of, um, um, say, well, say this part of the tensor network is defining one tensor, right? And the rest I'm kind of also gluing together sort of this one tensor, that one. Um, so I have sort of two big tensors, this brown one, Three indices, three indices here, and the orange one that I guess has say six at the top. As I'm, as I'm drawing it at the top without complex conjugating, but okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then well, there's these bonds in the middle, and I guess I shouldn't have used orange here. Maybe I'm going to use gray. So this is this bit. Um, that's that bit over here, right? And then we have, there's exactly these two connections here in the middle between them, right? There's this bond and that bond, and that's of course these two make up the boundary of A. Yes, these two bonds here, right? So that's just sort of, you know, if you twist the picture and you realize that that's gray guy actually consists of two blocks, then you can go from here to there and vice versa. So now what we achieved is we rolled this quantum state. If we think of it as a matrix, as a product of two matrices and uh, well, each of these matrices must have low rank, must have rank D to the number of legs uh, that's between here, right? Because that's just a fact about ranks of linear maps. So the Schmidt rank of this quantum state um, which is exactly this rank um, is at most d to the size of a. And by taking the logarithm, we arrive at this area of our formula. So maybe just a quick recap. And here we really use this particular structure of the network, right? If this network would be, I don't know, would have like edges all over the place, like more edges here, or maybe other kind of like non-obvious connections, then this formula would change. It's just a, somehow the, this regularity of the network makes it such that the sort of the geometric boundary of this interval a is, uh, is the same as in one to one corresponds with these virtual bonds that we're cutting as we disconnect the A part of the network with the A complement part of the network. And yesterday someone asked what happens in, if you had, if you had periodic, periodic boundary, boundary conditions, but then there would be another lag here. And that's, you know, maybe also something you would have to cut or not. I guess here for this particular subsystem, you wouldn't, right? Because some of that would just connect the two gray pieces, which we anyways treat as one tensor. But if say, if we would have looked at the left half chain, right, then suddenly there would have been a new neighbor. Okay, any questions about this? We already sort of discussed this a little bit yesterday, but good to take our time here. Okay. 
so, so now, I guess, uh, there's oh, all, sorry. Yep. I was going to ask, like, is a little picture on the right, like, technically less informative than the one on the left, since you, uh, since you don't know that the two ones on the edges are actually not connected? Or? Yeah, so we're totally losing information, uh, but it's sort of good enough to zoom in sort of on, on the on the essentials of the of the left hand side picture, which is the one that gives us this, this upper bound on the rank, right? Because for that, it was only important that, you know, we, we managed to split whatever, you know, however complicated the network is, the task that we basically have to do is we have to split it up. We have to cut through the network in such a way that we disconnect these dangling A legs and the A complement legs. Um, and the, the best way of cutting gives us the tightest bound on the rank. Um, and so here, uh, you know, uh, as, at least if A is large enough, the best way is cutting here and here, as opposed to cutting there or cutting there, which is actually what give, would, would give you the volume law. But, but yeah, definitely here we're losing lots of information because we're now treating these things as unstructured things, which they're not at all. Uh, plus this geometric information that those, these two legs, they're not adjacent. Yeah, good, good point. Uh, okay, uh, so, well, we proved this very strong area law that holds by construction for the max entropy, and one could ask, is the converse also true? So if you have a bound on the max entropy, meaning a bound on the ranks, or log ranks of the reduced states, can you then also build a uh, corresponding matrix product state? And that's true. So any state is a matrix product state um, uh, with the following bond dimensions. Maybe I'll write the logarithm of the bond dimension here. Um, and you can always take as the logarithm of the bond dimension the maximum of all of these max entropies of the subsystem that say starts at one and goes up to n. Okay, and of course that's sort of a well, this max is a bit ugly, right? So what you can really do is you can build a matrix product state where let's go up to the pick definition of the matrix product state where this dimension is exactly the rank and you know the, the max entropy. Sorry, this dimension is exactly the rank of the reduced density matrix of the first side. This dimension is exactly the rank of the reduced sense matrix of the first two sides, and so on and so forth. So, if you're happy with having not the same bond dimensions, you know, at, at all of these virtual bonds, then you can you can you can uh, derive a slightly sharper statement. Actually, that's what we're going to do in, in the proof. But if I, yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to simplify notation, so there's one bond dimension only, one virtual bond dimension only, and you would pick it as two to the max entropy of you know, so the, sorry, the largest the max entropy can be for any half chain wherever you put the split, however you partition the train to left and right. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so that means if you say had an area law for this max entropy, right, you would get a matrix product state description of your state with constant bond dimension in, in, in one dimension, right? Because area law would mean that this max entropy is just bounded by a constant. Okay. Uh, so that's nice. So how can we do this? Let's see if we manage. Um, so the idea is, well, we're going to take any state. So that's just some unstructured tensor. Some arbitrary state uh, psi. Uh, so now we have to decompose this tensor sort of, um, and, and what we're going to do is we're just going to, sort of do, you know, greedily sort of decompose it sort of step by step. So we are first trying to split off the very rightmost tensor. So we want to build kind of, you know, you want to write this guy as, you know, in n minus one tensor. Well, actually, actually well, a tensor that's n minus one physical x and one virtual leg times an, a single tensor that's kind of going to be the boundary. It's going to, right. So I guess it's easiest if I just write down what I mean. So what we're going to do is bigger. Uh, so how do we split a matrix, right, in, in a way that reflects the rank? Uh, in a, a, but, you know, something that doesn't require any other properties on a matrix. Um, that's by the singular value decomposition, right? Any matrix has a singular value decomposition, whether it's Hermitian or not. Um, so that seems like a nice thing because psi is an arbitrary object here. Now, singular value decomposition is about matrices. I wrote a tensor, so I somehow have to commit to some way of splitting the legs into two, into two pieces so that I can think of this object as a matrix. And I'm going to split here. So I'm going to separate the very rightmost leg from the rest. And so then I can do a singular value decomposition. And what does a singular value decomposition achieve? Well, it writes a matrix as a unitary times a diagonal matrix. Well, say an isometry times a diagonal matrix times an another isometry or isometry dagger. Okay. Or if you wish, you can use unitaries, but then the diagonal matrix has zeros. If you use isometries, then the diagonal matrix only has the non-zero entries. So I want to be very compact. So I want to use the singular value decomposition with isometries. Okay. So that the diagonal matrices that are remaining have, have as low, dim low dimension as possible. 
So, well, single algebraic position, as we were saying, is a product of three things. So there will be now three tensors, right? Just one tensor after single algebraic decomposition becomes three. So there will be sort of the diagonal matrix that's part of the single algebraic decomposition. So I'll denote this by a little triangle. Well, I guess this is going to move around in a moment. And well, in the single algebraic decomposition, the diagonal matrix, again, I can pick this matrix to be R by R, where R is the rank of this thing thought of as a matrix from these n minus one legs to the, the nth leg, okay? So that rank is exactly, uh, uh, you know, two to the max entropy, or it's that's exactly the rank of the reduced density matrix row one up to n. So wait, let me write this down. So this leg here, and of course also that one, the dimension would be the rank of row one up to n minus one, which is the same as the rank of row n. Uh, and those are the same as Patrick explained, right? By the Schmidt decomposition, if you have a pure state, you split into two pieces, then the eigenvalues are the same of both reduced states, all the ranks are the same and so on and so forth. So that's that's one bit of the single value decomposition. Now I have sort of the matrix that, you know, maps these uh, bases onto the left singular vectors and the one that maps the right singular vectors. So the, on the left-hand side, well, this should now be matrix from this new virtual bond to N minus one indices. So right, so here, these are the n minus one, and that's the last one. So the same n minus one are remaining here. And on the right, well, we have another tensor. And that one, well, it's from this orange new bond to simply this one leg here, right? So same, so there should be the same number of dangling legs on the left or the right. Okay, so this is my fancy way of, of well, uh, or strange way of writing singular value decomposition in tensor network language, okay. And maybe I just want to point out, right, so in the singular value equation, this is a diagonal matrix. Its entry are the non-zero singular values of the matrix, which correspond to the square roots of the eigenvalues of the reduced density matrix. So they encode actually the entanglement spectrum. And uh, then on the right, there's an isometry going from here to there. So that's an isometry. And on the left, similarly, uh, we have an isometry from this virtual bond to these, these, these physical bonds. Okay, great. Phew. So now we managed to split off uh, to split off one tens. Well, I guess we have two tensors now. We have this funny triangle. Uh, uh, sorry, I guess not the triangle. Uh, what's that? Uh, um, yeah, I'm not sure what the shape, like diamond shape. I guess that's a more technical word for it. <laughs> this diamond shape tensor in the middle. So I guess we we added two tensors. But the the crucial one that we like is this one. So this one we want to keep, and now we want to continue the procedure inductively, um, starting from here. And again, you should interrupt me now if sort of I was sort of maybe unclear or too jargony also in the way I'm drawing these pictures and so on. I guess maybe they all only make sense along with the storyline. Okay, well, so that's what I wanna do. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, so it seems like um, the result you get from this algorithm is gonna depend on the order in which you decide to do this to the legs. Is there any way in which you can choose an optimal order? Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's slightly, um, well, in the end, right, sort of in terms of the degrees of freedom that remain, it's it's all the same, right? Because because we are it's basically achieving that all these in the end we will find that all these bond dimensions they're exactly you know the 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 rank of the reduced density matrix. So that doesn't matter if we start from the right or from the left. Um, as to the I mean to the contents of the tensor, um, some of the properties we'll discuss they will be flipped, but I don't think that uh, has any fundamental influence. I believe. Uh, there's also a more symmetric way, kind of where you, yeah, where you keep these guys around. Maybe Bill mentioned this, um, but yeah. So you, I, I'm starting from the right um, purely for I don't know. Uh, I guess for reasons that now these isometries go to the right, and before we discussed, you know, whenever the tensor isometries, they have the sequential interpretation. I think I, I chose those to be, you know, left left to right. But there's no, nothing fundamental about it. Thank you. Thanks. Um, this this might be a related question. Um, sure. So, so then this decomposition into um, a matrix product state, it doesn't need to be unique, right? Yeah, fantastic question, yeah. Uh, that's right. I mean, so the thing that we are actually did sort of deriving now in the proof is often called the canonical form or a canonical form of the matrix product state. So it's, it's kind of canonical, like, you know, if all these Schmidt vectors would be, uh, uh, you know, if all the, the, the eigenvalues of, well, all the interest in the singular value would be disjoint and somehow there would not be so much freedom left in the end. Uh, but that's right. Yeah, so we'll just we'll actually discuss about that uh, later. Sort of how unique metric product states are, and that's a nice, a nice, uh, a nice story behind it. So we'll come back to that. Thank you. Oh, so here we're just deriving one particular form. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Um, is what you're describing just an exact version of DMRG? 
Um, well, DMRG usually has, I guess, has as an input a Hamiltonian, uh, and you want to find a ground state. So, as, uh, so okay. I think of DMRG as more of an optimization. I see. Um, but indeed, I mean, you could do an exact version of DMRG in some sense. Um, I see. And then, uh, yeah, maybe you would. Yeah, there's also, I guess, some orthogonalization sort of stuff going on. But but yeah, usually usually in DMRG you do these single value so that you can throw away stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay. And that is, of course, something we could do here as well. And we could ask, uh, you know, how much do we change the state in this way? And we'll, we'll ask that in a moment as well. Great question. All right, so, but now, well, we haven't, we haven't quite managed to actually decompose the state. So what I want to do is I want to look at this part of the tensor network again. So, so I'm ignoring this right-hand side uh, tensor. And what does it, well, if I ignore a generically, if I ignore a tensor on a tensor network, that's going to change the state, right? Because the tensors are not unitary or anything. But here I'm ignoring isometry. So this isometry only changes the basis somewhere on the right, but it does not change the reduced state on the left-hand side. So this gray box has exactly the same reduced states on these first n minus one subsystems. So that means that if we now proceed sort of inductively, we will actually get the right ranks out, right? So that would not that otherwise that needn't be true. But it so but it's always okay if you, you know if you have a bipolar quantum system and you apply a unitary on one side, it does never change just the state on the other side, right? That's what we're using here. So just sort of for if you want to sort of really believe what I'm doing. Okay, so now we have to do some more splitting up. And so what we're going to do is well, now we, we now we have to build a three tensor, right? Um, in this decomposition. So what we're going to do is we're going to split now. Oops, sorry. We're going to split this. Well, again, this I guess is an n tensor, and minus one legs here, one leg here. Now we're going to split here, like so. So we have n minus two legs on the left and two legs on the right, and we're going to do a single value decomposition again, but now only of, of this gray box. Okay. And if we did this, well, so including the the diamond, then we would get another sort of matrix that creates a left singular vector. So now there's n minus two indices here. There's one well new diamond in the middle. That's now encoding the singular values of this remaining tensor, but now with respect to a different split than the one we had before, right? N minus two versus two rather than N minus one versus one. And another object, well, that maps this new degree of freedom, well, to two, right? To two degree, to, to two ones, right? To, to that leg here, as well as to this one. So I'll draw them, of course, one goes down, one goes to the right. Okay, so the claim is I can do a single value decomposition of this box. So both of these tensors together, where they form an n tensor into n minus two versus these two legs. All right, uh, great. Um, and uh, well, this thing is of course, again, going to be an isometry. Likewise, this guy is going to be an isometry. This guy is going to be isometry from here to there. Oh, but I won't write that down. Okay, we achieved this by doing a single value decomposition. Um, and well, how about the dimensions of these of these legs? Well, both this uh, edge and this edge, uh, well, their dimensionality is uh, the rank of the reduced density matrix of the first n minus two sides here. And that's true again. That's true in principle only for the state defined by this gray box. But as we discussed, this isometry here doesn't change these ranks. So that actually also corresponds to the to the original state we we, we described. So the these these edges they have rank. Uh, of the reduced state of the first n minus two sides, which of course then is the same as of the last two. Okay, but I guess maybe we, I, I won't write down this this part anymore. Okay, great. And so now we, we well now I can sort of insert. Sorry, I think I did something silly. So this equality here, of course, only concerns the the gray box, right? So this was this was um, me decomposing this gray box over here, this tensor, right? So now I have to plug this back into the picture, right? So I will replace this gray box by its SVD that we right, derived in this form. Uh, so what I have to do is I have to basically just take this picture and add the tensor that we neglected before to it, okay? So maybe I can just do this by copy paste. So I have this guy and then I just add this one on top. No, that's one not on top at the end. Like so, okay. And so now I just continue, right? This is continue this process inductively doing SVDs. Uh, um, you know, now I would do an SVD of this part, ignoring both of these uh, blue maps and so on and so forth. And then in the end, right, we see that now the rank of this, 
emphasize the ones that are going to now stay the same and not change anymore. The last one has rank of the reduced state of the first n minus one sites. This has rank reduced state of the first n minus two sites and so on. And that's of course two times, two to the max entropy, right? Log logarithms are power two in, in QI lectures, I think. So, 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 right? so the log of the bond, the log of these bond dimensions are exactly these max entropies. And then of course I can always pad them to, you know, take them to be the max of all of them. But, but the, the, this proof now gives you something more precise. Okay. Okay, so that was maybe a little bit technical, um, but we, we achieved something cool, right? So we, uh, uh, in particular, what we can do is we can apply, well, this applies to any quantum state. We can also apply this to a matrix product state itself, right? To sort of trim down its bond dimension to sort of, to make it, you know, maximally compact in a way. So that's great. Um, again, if our state satisfied an area law for this max entropy, that would be super. We could just apply this straight away. Um, and, uh, you know, by virtue of the proof, we achieved uh, something that again is called the canonical form or A, that's three canonical forms that people usually discuss uh, for matrix product states. Here we discussed one. Um, so again, by virtue of the proof, what we found is that we can actually turn all of the tensors to be isometries from left to right and bottom, right? That just arose from the singular value decomposition. So um, we can, Right, any matrix product states, we can rewrite, right? There's some degree of freedom. We can rewrite it in such a way that this is an isometry, this map is an isometry, always in the sense of the, you know, the directionality of, uh, of the arrows that I'm drawing. So each tense is an isometry from left to right and bottom. Can I ask a question? Yep. Um, so in your little proof that you did, um, yes. you always ended up with this diamond that was the singular values of the, the first, what was it the first n minus one legs? Is that right? Um, what, so in the last step, what happens to that? Like it seems oh, like very you, good. Have, you yeah. have a diamond left over. So what is that? That's like? right, yeah, yeah, the, a great question. Yeah, the last step is indeed, it's basically just a diamond, right? Or a diamond on the basis change in some sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's basically exactly preparing the, a, a bipartite state. It's exactly preparing a, a, pure, a pure state of two systems. And uh, its entanglement spectrum is the square of the entries of the diamond. Okay. So that actually is a normalized quantum state. Okay. Because the diamonds, they have a, it, actually, as, a, as I mean, I, I only wrote down the ranks here, but really the content of the diamonds, the entries are exactly the square root of, you know, the, the, what's called the Schmidt coefficients in Patrick's lecture, I think, mm -hmm. or, you know, the square roots of the eigenvalues of the reduced states. Mm -hmm. So then norm squares are equal to one. So that defines a nice normalized quantum state. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, why sort of the, in the first step here, right? This is sort of, a, I guess, well, you can think of this as an isometry from nothing to two systems, but it's really preparing a state, right? So first right. step is preparing a state and then you apply those, these step isometries. And then in the end, you just do base change. Okay. Great question. Okay, thank you. And because these diamonds are so meaningful, you can actually also keep them around. So there's a different normal form where you don't absorb them into the tensors, but they actually have the form tensor diamond, tensor diamond, tensor diamond, and so on and so forth. And then it really gets sort of a nice decomposition of, a, of this matrix product state. Basically, and you know, there's the singular values so or the, the entanglement spectrum. And then the whole left half chain is just doing a big base change, you know, from this virtual bond to the physical indices and the other way around as well. Maybe this is so nice, I should really draw it real quick. So we can also build something where we have like lots of diamonds. So that's maybe also an exercise. Um, and now this property has the, uh, this, this way of doing it. Um, so, so these, now the tensors here are different. We are sort of absorbing an inverse of the diamond into the tensors to make it look this way. Now this has the property that however, wherever you cut the chain, um, the, this whole uh, left part is defining isometry from here to here. The whole right part is defined isometry from here to there. And well, so what this is, the, the, so this is really giving you a Schmidt decomposition of this matrix product state, right? You start with the, with the right Schmidt coefficients, the diamond, contact of the diamond here. And then you're just doing, you know, this is you're creating the left Schmidt vectors, right Schmidt vectors. Um, so that's maybe an exercise uh, to, to go from the proof or to the this previous step. Well, let's say to go from the proof by a slightly different repackaging of the result of the SVD to here. So then you can really read off the entanglement between left and right at any bond at the same time from the content of these diamonds. So can I ask a follow-up before you move on? Yep. On that? So yep, then yep, yep. 
just like you just said, then if I were to look at the picture you just made and I focus in on that first, um, the first tensor on the left, then I can interpret that diamond uh, that's next to it as being the, the entanglement between this leftmost tensor site and the rest of the tensor network. Is that right? That's correct. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, All right. exactly. Yeah. And sort of in this picture, we basically absorbed, I mean, this diamond into the left uh, mm -hmm. tensor, right? So here in this picture, this tensor would just do a base change. First perspective, right? So if you split here, right, this would just be an isometry here and the rest would be an isometry from, from here to there. Uh, and basically the relation between these two is that in the, in the top formulation, this tensor contains the diamond. So it's like a super tensor. Um, and that's why it's not isometric anymore, but rather creating a state. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, great, okay. So now, um, of course, I planned way too much uh, for today. Um, maybe it's uh, still worth saying uh, that somehow this assumption is very strong, right? I mean, it's 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 kind of cool what we design, but but generically we won't be able that to but we won't expect that you know if you hand me an interesting physics -y state that it can compress things very much, and that's because ranks are extremely stringent. Some of this max entropy is just too large. Um, so the sort of this well, I guess when I say assumption, or maybe uh, maybe I'll just say as max uh, well typically won't satisfy area law. I mean, doesn't change the math, right? I mean, math is still right, but somehow it maybe makes us uh, uh, more skeptical about the usefulness of this proof. Okay. Uh, so what to do with it? Um, so now what we could ask is it maybe, well, ranks are too strong, right? So what we wanna do is we wanna basically allow ourselves a little bit of error. The kind of the interesting statement say from a physics point of view should be, um, that if you have say an array law state, um, you know, then what you would like to be able to say is that there exists a very good approximation to that physical state by a matrix product state, but you allow for a very for a small error, right? Maybe an error that's, you know, is, I don't know, some constant, if you're happy you know, with computing expectation values up to some constant, or maybe you can even ask for the error to decrease as the system size increases, so that's also okay. But you would like, um, so if, you know, so you, you, you want to be happy. So some of this, I mean, this theorem kind of, well, I guess, uh, uh, somehow, you know, because, because, because of this bound here, right? If in reality, the max entropy does not satisfy an area law, there's just no hope of getting an exact re, 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 rewriting of your quantum state in this matrix product state form. So we, we have to go for an approximation. Okay. And hopefully we can just get a very good one. So, so this, if one sort of continues the thought and if one asks, okay, what is a robust version of a rank? Well, the easiest thing is that you have a density matrix. You just allow yourself to discard, you know, really small eigenvalues up to some threshold that is set. And this threshold should hopefully dictate the error in the end of the approximation that you get. So what one can do is one can, uh, um, and I think Patrick didn't have time to discuss that. One can define something that's called a smooth version of an entropy. So in particular, the smooth max entropy hmm. Is, a, is basically exactly answering this question. Suppose um, I allow myself, so the notation is going to be used, I guess we used S, right, not H, sorry. Uh, so S max, right, is like this log rank, um, but we are going to add a little epsilon here. And this epsilon basically tells us how, ma how much of the state are we allowed to discard, right? And so we are asking what's basically the effective rank of the quantum state. So hopefully if I um, define things in the right way, what this means is that we're going to look at the logarithm of the minimal possible rank when we just change a state by epsilon and say trace distance. And what that amounts to um, should be basically, we're going to minimize over all numbers R, so sort of these effective ranks, such that if we sum the first R eigenvalues of this quantum state rho, then we wanna get at least one minus epsilon of the, of the probability mass, right? So these, so lambda is here, lambda one, larger than equals to lambda two and so on, are the eigenvalues of rho sorted uh, non-increasingly. So we have this quantum state row, right? We sort the eigenvalues and then we're discarding small eigenvalues up until an error epsilon. Okay. And then the rank of this thing or rather logarithm of this rank that's called the smooth, the epsilon smooth max entropy. And um, one can show that um, uh, any state is, well, delta, well, close to a matrix product state where the bond dimensions are given by the smooth max entropies uh, if you allow for an error, that's just adding up all the epsilons that you pick for each bond. 
Okay, so I'll write down a precise statement. Any state, yes. Someone is asking a question. I, why, yeah. yeah. Okay. Can you clarify, please, why the SMAX typically doesn't satisfy the error with the construction we have? Um, I mean, I, I didn't give you a proof. I mean, I didn't write down a specific physical model where that's not 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 violated. But but I'm I'm just saying somehow, um, if you look at entropies or any entropies, right? If you have really small eigenvalues, they won't contribute. And so sort of in practice, that's why we can prove these area laws. But I mean, it, it will generically not be true that really the density operate itself is, is extremely low rank if you look at a large region. Um, but somehow this, it will be effectively low rank, you know, up to a, like a very, I mean, there's a vast um, majority of the state will be supported on a very low dimension subspace on a subspace, but you know, whose dimension scales or log dimension scales for the area rather than the volume. But that probably won't be true exactly, typically, uh, unless, you know, up, up, except for say, you know, sort of model model systems, very sort of particular model systems, maybe. Thanks. I mean, it, for example, I mean, it would be true if you say, you know, this is like, you know, toy models of topological order or something, right? And there you can really write down exact, um, exact uh, transcendent effect descriptions. Also, uh, for example, say for toric code, for example, toric code ground, uh, ground states, you can write down, you know, it's an exact um, tensor network with constant bond dimension. Um, but, you know, when things are a bit more messy and you can't ex exactly solve your models anymore, then maybe that's too, too stringent. Um, but it's also not needed. You are, you are totally happy with approximations, especially, right? Uh, I guess a lot of the field has developed maybe from a numerics point of view. And there, you know, people are going to try to find these tensors. I mean, they won't write them down by hand, but they, there's some optimization. And so anyways, you will never get at a true, you know, a truly exact description. So it's more like you want to hope that you could get somewhere close. But yeah, I didn't give a, an example of a, of a, you know, some concrete Hamiltonian, but, but that would not be the case. Yeah. Um, it's maybe also, yeah, it's maybe an interesting um, maybe exercise to think about, you know, what are, what are eigenvalue distributions of density matrices where all these entropies are very different, right? Where say the max entropy is much larger than say a Renyi one half entropy is much larger than a phenomenon entropy and so on. Maybe that gives you some, some more intuition. Okay, so the statement I want to make is that any um, state is, um, and I mean, it could well be that the constants are slightly wrong here. It's basically somehow epsilon n oh, close uh, to a matrix product state with bond dimension, well, with bond dimension, log bond dimension is I guess the thing I'm always writing. Uh, and now instead of taking the max entropies, I'm going to take an epsilon max entropy um, for the first n sites, right? So maybe we just take, well, I guess I could take the same epsilon everywhere, right? And then I get just an error that's system size times epsilon in total. So the, the key point is that these errors add up and that's not actually so obvious. Uh, and the way to prove it is actually, well, uh, I think sort of John was alluding, alluding to it before, it's basically cutting down these diamonds here. So you go into the singular value decomposition and you can basically, well, you can start with say one of these normal forms, say this normal form, and then uh, you truncate the diamonds by you know, discarding the smallest eigenvalues, right? Because the, the, the entries of the diamond, they're exactly squared of these lambda i's. So you discard the right amount, but then you have to prove that somehow that you know actually only changes the state uh, you know by the same factor by, by by epsilon and not by something more, and that uses crucially this unitarity or this isometric isometric nature of the of this normal form. So the fact that because with isometries errors cannot blow up, right? if you have a general matrix where right, things will blow up by the operator norm, but here everything is isometries so from here to here and so on. So I so I mean I'm I'm being very vague here, and one, that's actually something one has to prove and, and think about. But sort of the procedurally, um, what one uh, can uh, basically do is uh, same proof as above, uh, but but uh, but truncate the diamonds. So truncate uh, in above proof. Um, and again, well, these diamonds, they're diagonal matrices, right? And the entries are really squared lambda one, squared lambda two, and so on. So you're gonna just crunch them down. Okay, um, and now it is also true. Um, well, now we have this, well, I, I guess we <laughs> we we didn't like the max entropy uh, because it didn't satisfy an error. Now we have a new entropy and uh, one we haven't discussed yet. Um, but it, it is true um, that you can, if you have a bound on Renyi entropies, then you can also bound the smooth max entropy. Okay, 
in a way that kind of becomes terrible as epsilon goes to zero, and in a way that also becomes terrible as your Rennie parameter goes to one, which means phenomenal entropy. So I'll, I'll just write down a bound, which I think is correct, um, up to maybe plus minus one, so something like that. Um, so, okay, let me just, uh, uh, let's just see. So what we see, so we have this uh, approximation result and now we basically want to make use of it. So we have to bound these, these max entropies. And it is true that say the epsilon max entropy of a state can be bounded by say a Rennie alpha entropy plus something like alpha over one minus alpha times uh, log one over epsilon uh, plus some constant uh, that only depends on alpha but on nothing else, okay. And that's true for alpha uh, less than one. Okay. So, right, if, if alpha, maybe we can check with some sanity checks. So, if, if alpha were zero, right, then, um, well, this thing would just not contribute. So, we, we would get the result the smooth max entropy is less equal to the max entropy, which is the S, the zero rank entropy. So, that's of course clear because here we're just discarding stuff. So, rank becomes smaller or the entropy becomes smaller. Um, as alpha goes to one, right, um, this thing uh, is going to blow up. So if you have an array law for the phenomenon entropy, uh, this won't help us. Okay. Also, as the this error that we allow epsilon goes to zero, this term will still blow up. Okay, except in the in alpha, in the alpha equals zero case. So somehow this tells us that based an array law, something like an, an array law. So for the exact Rennie entropy, gives us you know uh, uh, also well a good bound also for um, for the smooth max entropy, but somehow how good it is actually depends on this choice of epsilon. Okay. But typically, how do we want to pick this epsilon here? Well, in the end, right, these errors accumulate. So we want you want to pick this epsilon as something like one over the system size, for example, right? If you want a constant, well, let's say delta over the system size to get a constant error delta in the end, because you're adding it up n times. Right, then this thing is going to be like log n, and that's okay. That's much better, like it's not extensive, right? So, so that's, I mean, there's, I guess, more one could write down here, but sort of in what, what this now allows us to see is that an area law, uh, um, uh, so thus, area law for a Rennie entropy for alpha less than one implies, uh, well, good, uh, um, or maybe I'll just write MPS approximations, whereby I mean matrix product state approximations with bond dimensions that grow at most polynomially in the size of the system, not exponentially. So the whole like, you know, description size of the state is only polynomial. Some of the bond dimensions, I mean, you will have noticed that the bond dimensions come out here, they're actually not constant. So, right, even though maybe we are hoping for constant bond dimensions because, you know, area law would make you think, you know, could make you hope for this. The bond dimensions here, they will grow, but mildly with the system size, not, not exponentially. And that was, that's sort of the key feature that we wanted, right? If we go back to sort of this parameter counting here. Um, that's sort of, you know, what we know how to prove and, and you know, as, as theoreticians. Um, of course, in practice, you know, one runs this, you know, with some like choice of one dimension and it works really well, really much better than what we're able to prove. But that's, uh, that's sort of the state of affairs. Okay. Um, yeah, that's uh, so, right. So maybe I guess we discussed this yesterday already in, in the Q&A afterwards. So what's the general situation um, in, in one dimensions for gap systems? So we have a, a we, we're interested say in gap local Hamiltonians in 1D then there one can prove very non-trivially that uh, the Rennie entropy satisfies an area law. So that's a result to first due to Hastings. Uh, it was improved uh, uh, by, by, by several people for like general ground states and whatnot. Um, so we have an, a Rennie error law. Um, uh, and the Rennie error law gets us this well, kind of area law for this max entropy and hence we get good matrix product state approximations. There's another line of work that says, well, if you have, that proves that if you have a, a gap local Hamiltonian in one dimension, uh, then you have an you can also prove exponential decay of correlations, and you can use the decay of correlations also as an input to prove an area law for the max smooth max entropy. And again, you get good matrix product state approximations. So that's kind of these two routes that that one can pursue. But basically, the upshot is that that gapped local well gap ground states in one dimension they are completely super under control, both theoretically um, and you know in terms of numerics, if you wish. Okay, so I guess we have an existence proof here in some sense of, of the easier part of the theory, but nowadays there's even rigorous algorithms for finding that. Okay, so that's maybe one, one way of summarizing in my, in my notes. I, I have a bit more detail if, if you're interested in that. Um, I guess there's lots of things, well, I, one could discuss, for example, there was this interesting question before, how, about, how much freedom is there in a matrix product state description? 
Okay. And uh, maybe uh, when you ask this question, what you had in mind is the following. Suppose I have a, uh, you know, a matrix product state and I just focus on these, two on these two tensors here. Now, something I can always do, it's kind of like a gauge degree of freedom. I can add an arbitrary matrix here and another arbitrary matrix, but sorry, and the inverse of that matrix on the right-hand side, then of course, G times G inverse is the identity. So this does not change the, the state that's being produced by this network. But I can also absorb this element into those tensors, right? So I can look at a new, I can redefine the tensors multiplying, you know, the right index of the left tensor by G and here the left index of that tensor by G inverse or G minus transpose or something like that. And, and now you've redefined your tensors. So, so somehow that's the degree, that's some freedom that we can never uh, avoid, right? That's just in the parameterization uh, um, unless, well, you think about canonical forms and whatnot. And even then you can apply unitaries in this way. Um, but it's a sort of interesting question to ask whether that's all the freedom you have. And there are some conditions in the literature that are uh, um, where, under which one can actually show this. So, so that's something called normality or injectivity. And maybe that's, I mean, I'll, I'll write something about in the notes, but, but maybe it's not what's so important right now, um, which uh, basically implies that, and that that's the only freedom you have in, in certain class of states. Um, so, uh, and that's very powerful because it relates to symmetries because somehow another way in which you can, uh, so suppose you have a, a tensor network state, um, a matrix product state, sorry, that has say a global symmetry, right? So that means, well, what does it mean? It means that th this state that I'm writing down here is the same as when you apply some, I guess I call this G now as in group element. So that's the action of some group, right? So global symmetry here would mean G to the tensor N applied to my matrix product state as the state itself. Right, so we would find that this picture is the same as that picture over here. Right. So now, um, right. Well, this thing I can also think of as a new as a new tensor, right? So kind of what this is saying is that well, each of these tensors, well, we, we can basically, um, if these two tensors are the same, then there's a way of writing this tensor network actually as that one, but with little gg inverses, h h inverse, and so on inserted. So what that basically implies is that um, you can, if you have a global symmetry in your tensor network, then that should be closely related to the fact that the local tensors are equivariant with respect to the symmetry, right? Meaning that if you apply say G and G inverse here, uh, that should be the same as if you apply G here. Okay, and of course these can be different representations of your group, of your symmetry group, right? There's some representation here and there's the others here and there are some branching rules that of course dictate what you can add there. But sort of the point I wanted to make is if you have sort of this local, I don't know, gauge symmetry or something, or if your tensors are intertwiners, then that actually implies global symmetry and under some technical conditions, oops, you can also go back. Okay, so I mean, I, I, I understand that some of this uh, very maybe uh, fast and very sloppy, but I just want to give an impression of the kind of games one can also play in land of matrix products so that we maybe won't have time to talk about. So this uniqueness in the parameterization is intimately related to symmetries, classification of states, classification of quantum phases with symmetries, um, symmetry protected phases and 1D and so on. And one can then all carry this out on the tensor network level. Okay. Um, right, so in particularly, yeah, so that's, I guess what I want to say. Something else that we haven't discussed yet um, is uh, how to actually find tensors, right? So, so I guess we have some theoretical arguments now um, why say in the presence of an area law, we should be able to find a nice matrix product state description. But if you know, if you were a numerics person or maybe a theoretician who wants to do experiments, numerical experiments, you actually want to find these, right? You have like your favorite Hamiltonian, you want to find the right tensors. Um, and there's lots of, well, there's a number of options that you can, uh, you can look at. Um, there's one algorithm that's called DMRG, it was mentioned um, before by Jonathan. Um, and basically what that one is doing is kind of optimizing uh, um, well, you have an Hamiltonian, so you want to minimize the energy, right? So you do variation optimization. And uh, well, in general, that's hard here because this is a multilinear problem. There's lots of tensors. But if you fix all but one tensor, then it becomes more tractable. And that's what basically people are doing. So they're basically fixing all but one tensor, and then you optimize the, optimizing that tensor in such a way that you minimize the energy. You can do this very efficiently using the techniques we discussed. And then you sort of sweep through, you know, you sweep through them through the line back, you know left to right, left to right, left to right, until things converge. Uh, works super well, uh, I think due to Steve White. Uh, we don't know how to prove that it works. I mean, that's something I find very interesting. 
Um, uh, there's also rigorous algorithms, but they're not quite as competitive, but they are run in polynomial time, which, which makes me happy. Um, there's also other ways of doing it, right? So you can, um, uh, I mean, you see, I'm a bit, I'm, I guess I'm being, uh, I'm being a bit uh, a bit more high level now because it's the last few minutes and I just want to give you sort of a little outro to, to these matrix product states. Yeah, you, um, you have five you, minutes. Oh, five minutes, great, yeah. Um, so yeah, so, so there's another way of sort of, you know, in principle constructing and also in practice constructing uh, quantum states, which is of course, you know, a, a ground states, uh, which is of course that you are thinking of your, you know, a thermal state at a really low temperature or very large inverse temperature, right? So if you could somehow find a tensor network description of e to the minus beta h for large beta, that would basically be the projection on the ground state of your, of your system, right? I mean, up to normalization, which we anyways never worry about in tensor networks because we can easily compute the norm. So a question could be, how can you de design a tensor network um, that describes this operator e to the minus beta h? Um, maybe someone has an idea how one could go about it. Maybe in the context of, I mean, it's very similar to maybe how, I mean, you could also ask, how can I do time evolution of a matrix product state, right? Same question kind of, but now there's an I in the game. It's e to the minus I H T instead of e to the minus beta H. Right? So something you could do is you could, um, well, if you're Hamiltonian, right? Suppose your Hamiltonian consists of non-interacting terms, right? It would be H12, um, H34, and so on and so forth, right? Then of course, the exponential of such Hamiltonian would just be a tensor product of the exponential of H12, tensor H23, and so on. So it's easy to exponentiate such an object, but of course that's boring um, because typically we also have, you know, other nearest neighbor terms like H23 uh, plus H, uh, I don't know, four five plus and so on. But what we can do is we can split our Hamiltonian into two pieces, right? Let's call this one the uh, maybe H even uh, and H odd. Of course, those won't commute in general. So it's not going to be true that e to the minus beta h is the same as e to the minus beta h even times e to the minus beta h odd. But if beta was really small, then that would be approximately true. That's called the, the Trotter formula, right? Trotterization. So um, what we can do is we can basically think of this operator as many iterations, say capital T many iterations of the same kind of um, you know, Gibbs state operator uh, but now uh, we can, if we pick T large, then this is a small number. Right? And if this is a small number, it's approximately true that this is e to the minus beta T H even, e to the minus beta T H odd. Okay. So again, I mean, we also wanna take beta large, right? So now T has to be really large, uh, but okay. And so now the point is, well, um, we, we just want to find a tensor network for say one of these here. And that's easy because they are like local non-commuting, uh, local commuting terms. And let me just compose the whole thing, right? So maybe that's the last pictures I'm going to draw. So suppose you're interested in e to the minus epsilon, just some small number times h even, right? That's of course the same as, well, you take the exponential e to the minus epsilon h12. So that's an operator say from top to bottom yeah, from, from bottom to top for some reason. Um, similarly, same, right? E to the epsilon H234 uh, and so on, so, right? That's, uh, that's one term, so that's easy. Now we multiply this by E to the epsilon H odd, which of course looks exactly the same, uh, but shifted by one, right? This would be E to the minus epsilon H23 and so on and so forth. I mean, we're getting a little non-unitary circuit here. Uh, and now we just repeat this many, many times, okay? And it's sort of, again, an exercise to see that we can also rewrite this maybe in a nicer way as um, basically one can sort of rewrite this tensor network if one allows this one dimension to be a bit larger, say twice or four times the one dimension on the left, the dimension on the left. Uh, so one can actually write um, sort of this, this operator here as, well, a tensor network that has bra and cat indices, like, like the reduced state that we had before, right? That's called a matrix product operator usually. Matrix product operator. I mean, it's not really important for what I'm going to say, but it just makes the picture nicer to draw. Now, how can I therefore write e to the minus beta h, right? e to the minus beta h is approximately, well, we already have a picture for this operator. Now we, we draw it t times and we connect, connect the legs, right? 
So it's so I would just have many layers of this operator stacked on top of each other. Or what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this one and I'm going to stack many copies copies uh, on top of each other. Right. So I have one layer. And then the next one. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, and so on and so forth. Like lots of these, right? And each of these is basically evolving by a, a tiny step in imaginary time. Okay. So that's the operator, right? That, that's e to the minus beta h. Now I want to apply this just to some arbitrary state. Hopefully that state I'm applying it to doesn't have like super small overlap with the with the with the state I'm interested in. Um, but suppose you know this is a good uh, state to start with, right? So I would basically just state start with the product states here. Uh, so right then this tensor network in principle would co would would correspond to the ground state. Okay, pretty exactly up to the error we made in, in trotterization here. Okay, so that yeah again that looks like some discretized kind of Euclidean path integral thing, right? But really just derived by trotterizing operators. Now. Um, of course, I mean, this is not a matrix product state what's written here, right? Because, well, I guess you could think of it as a matrix product state if you glue everything together here as one tensor, one tensor here, one tensor here. But that's terrible, right? Because now the bond dimension is this, 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 right? It's sort of going to be the more layers you have, the worse it is. So what you can do in practice is kind of you apply this layer by layer. So you start with the product state and you fix your favorite bond dimension. And because the product state any bond dimension does, but let's say you pick it, you know, whatever you can you can live with. Now you apply one layer of this, you know, time evolution, uh, uh, imagine time evolution operator, and you truncate down to the, de the desired bond dimension that you're still happy to live with, right? So, and then you apply another layer. Again, you you know, trunk down if need be, right? So whenever you add one layer, the bond dimension grows by a factor of d, uh, where d is somehow uh, this bond dimension here. But then you sort of compress it back again by discarding irrelevant parts, and hopefully you don't make you know too much error in this way. And so sort of, I guess it's somehow a self-consistent. And you know if it works, then you know uh, an area law will hold, and, and we would sort of hope that in in between somehow you know you don't need more entanglement in between un up until when you actually are at the ground state. Okay, I should I should really stop as is what Tom's going to say, uh, which is what I I'll, I'll do. Mm -hmm. So I think that wraps up the matrix product state um, uh, discussion. Um, which means that we achieved exactly 33% of uh, today's goals. Uh, the good thing is that the other part was basically just a, a page or so. So maybe I'll do that tomorrow. And then we'll really switch gears. We'll sort of you know, forget tensors for half a lecture and rather think about you know, what do we expect from a toy model of holography. And then hopefully these things will come together at the end of tomorrow's lecture or on Friday. Okay, so thanks, thanks a lot. All right, thanks, Michael. Um... All right. Um, do we have any quick questions? Uh, so I have two unrelated questions. Um, the first one is, I guess, what is the right intuition for why the ground states of gapped uh, Hamiltonian, gapped local Hamiltonians, um, satisfy an area law or have exponential decay of correlations? And then the second question was about the. Um, the local symmetries implying global symmetries. So I guess in like a general quantum system, like it's not going to be true that like having local gauge symmetry is going to give you a global symmetry. So what is it about these matrix product states that are so special that you have this property? Yes, yeah, so about the first question, um, uh, I guess we spoke about it briefly yesterday. I mean, in I, I mean, I guess the, I mean, the, the vague intuition, I guess, is, is because, you know, some interactions are local, hopefully, you know, in the ground state, not too much a long distance correlation can build up. So there should be some correlation length. And that's, I guess, just saying we expect correlations decay, but hopefully all, well, so in particular entanglement. Uh, I mean, it's not a very precise reason, maybe, but that's, I, I think, the intuition I can give, right? And then kind of, you know, if, if there's no energy gap, then, right, then things become critical and things, I mean, we know can decay more slowly. Um, I, I think that's maybe more or less the same I said yesterday. Uh, I'm I'm not sure I uh, I can say something smarter on this level of of discussion um, about the symmetries. I mean, uh, I guess there's two aspects right to this. So somehow, I mean, what I so very briefly sketched. I mean, that's sort of the yeah, that's sort of the constructive part, and then that's the, you know sort of the, the analysis part. So so what I what I so what is sort of just you know 
uh, formally true is that whenever you build a state from tensors and the local tensors, they satisfy symmetry uh, in the sense, then this will define a global state that, that still carries the same symmetry. Uh, maybe what's more interesting and, and, and not obvious and, and you know, uh, a priori is if you do have a tensor, if you do have a matrix product state description, which we now believe that you can always get, right, say for gap local uh, systems, and maybe your state does have a global symmetry, uh, why does that give rise to this local symmetry, right, where the, now the virtual bonds come into play? Um, that's that's not so obvious, and it it um, uh, it requires, I mean, it requires some technology. I mean, one has to prove something there, but somehow, right, somehow this is now about sort of, yeah, it's kind of like, in some sense, it's, Right, it's relating to degrees of freedom you didn't see originally, right? It's like this, this somehow now we have some like this the symmetry on, on this on this level, right? It relates somehow uh, uh, transforming these virtual bonds here, right? Uh, I mean, it sort of says that you know if you locally transform your tensor, then you can lift this on the level of virtual bonds. So that's kind of what comes out here. Yeah. Um, right. So somehow the yeah, I guess somehow the. Yeah, and the, and the way one can see it basically is is by 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 yeah by by asking this question about how much freedom is the action's parameterization. So somehow somehow if one, um, yeah, what's a good thing to say? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that's yeah, it's just a it's just a result somehow that that uh, um, you know under some say technical conditions uh, somehow. I guess the, the, some of the, the version I gave here, some of the, the, the simplest one. If you have a general matrix product state, then it doesn't look quite as simple as scenario does. There can be, of course, multiple sectors, but you can also like to change things and so on. Uh, so some of the, the situation I described here is is in the in the following situation. Maybe maybe I'm still allowed to say this real quick. It's in the situation where your tensor network satisfies the following property, uh, namely the tensors have the property that the map from the virtual bonds to the physical bonds is injective. That's called an injective matrix product state. Uh, that's a bit weird, right? Because somehow it means that those dimensions here should be smaller than this dimension. So typically it won't be true at the level of a single tensor, but if you coarse grain your system, if you block together many things, then it can become true. Um, it is often true. And this basically says that, uh, you know, the kind of the, the edge, these virtual degrees of freedom, they really fully determine the, what's going on the physical level. Like there's some one-to-one mapping of virtual to physical states. And that's kind of why you can easily lift this, the symmetries and also why things are quite constrained, why you only have this degree of freedom. And then the more general situation, I think, is a bit more technical, and it's, it's less, it may be a bit less beautiful than here. Maybe that's all I, I, I want to say here, and maybe we can talk more uh, later. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, that was it. oh, Simon ah, that was, it. was asking for references. Maybe. Yeah, it's it's exactly about this thing. Um, yes, yes, yes. I, I shall provide. Yes. Thanks. So it's called the fundamental theorem of matrix product states. If one searches for this, then basically one finds it many, uh, there's many versions of it for finite tensor networks, for infinite ones, uh, where all the translation variant ones and so on. And yeah. Uh, more questions? Um, okay. Um, let's let's uh, stop the recording and then we can we can hang out if Michael is free and